I've gotten to know Marie Dallum through the American Academy of Religion, of which we are both a member and both part of uh, the New Religions uh, group that's uh, kind of a subgroup within the Academy. Uh, I was on the uh, uh, governing committee of that group for a while, and Marie became a head of that group, and then I'm now rotated off of it. Uh, as happens, that she continues as head of it. Uh, she comes to us from uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, for all of you Texas fans, she's up at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, uh, I learned quite by accident uh, through some remarks that got dropped at a meeting we had at Baylor some time ago that she was doing some work on the Cowboy Church, and I thought as we were putting this uh, set of sessions together that that would be a perfect topic to consider. I knew absolutely nothing about the Cowboy Church at that time. I've learned a little bit since then, but uh, I'm hoping to learn a lot more tonight. So the floor is yours. I almost missed my cue there. I was in the ladies' room. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Gordon, and uh, thank you for inviting me here, and, and thank you to Baylor's ISR for sponsoring this series. It looks really interesting. Um, so I'm in the middle of a research project about the Cowboy Church. I still have a long way to go. Um, I'm focusing on not only the Cowboy Church, but also other aspects of Cowboy Christian life. I'm focusing on Oklahoma and Texas specifically, Texas is really the hub of the cowboy church movement and Oklahoma was its first big offshoot. So it's um, both sensible to focus on these two locations, but it's also geographically convenient for me since I'm in Oklahoma. So it's a nice correspondence of things. Um, so I'm from the East and I moved to Oklahoma in 2009 and I arrived on Friday night, uh, July 31st. And on August 1st, the very next night, I opened up the local paper and started perusing the church pages because I'm interested in the local religious scene. And that's where I first saw it, Cowboy Church. And I was like, what's Cowboy Church? Never heard of this. Um, I will admit I didn't actually do anything about my curiosity for quite some time. Uh, but it did keep rolling around in the back of my mind. Cowboy Church, what is that? Occasionally I'd see uh, an ad somewhere for it, or a, uh, actually several times I saw floats and parades advertising local cowboy churches. Um, so it just kept nagging at the back of my brain. So uh, fast forward to 2013, I've now been working on this project for a couple of years. I have visited about 30 cowboy churches, I've interviewed about 20 cowboy pastors, and I've spoken with countless attendees. I've read memoirs and journals from the Old West, I've read newspapers from old cow towns and trade journals from the cattle industry, I've attended rodeo church and racetrack church and Christian horse breakings. I've been to Cowboy Church University, which is the um, training seminar for the Nazarene Church. If you want to start a new cowboy church, you go there to learn how to do it. I've also been to Ranch House School, which is the basic same, basically the same thing, but for Baptists. And I've grown extremely fond of it all through this process. I really enjoy participating in all of these things. But um, I have to tell you, with all of this under my belt, I still get a little bit stumped on the question of what is the cowboy church? It's actually much more difficult to describe with accuracy than I had ever imagined because the more I learn about it, the bigger it is and, and just the more difficult it is to express um, in, a, in a tight little sentence. Now, many pastors, it turns out, describe it like this. It's just church. Uh, some describe it as simply church in a particular style, church with a hook, church with a gimmick. One anonymous pastor said, I am highly flexible and adaptive. I'll fly a hammer and sickle up above the church if I think it would reach somebody. Another popular preacher described the cowboy church idea as hokey and marketing and said he didn't want to do it when he was first asked. Yet another one said, 
if I started over again, I wouldn't put the cowboy church sign up. It's just church. But despite what they say, it's not just church. There's something much more to it that they're underestimating when they give me that kind of answer. And yet at the same time, I don't disagree with them. Uh, but what I've found is that breaking the question down into smaller sub-questions really helps me get at the answer in a, in a much more accurate way. So that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Some of the sub-questions I'm looking at as part of my bigger quest to understand what the Cowboy Church actually is. So for example, one of my foundational questions in looking at this phenomenon, if this religious movement is meant to appeal to cowboys or to be about cowboys, who is the cowboy today? And with just a little bit of exploration, I began to see that when any one of us hears the word cowboy, it doesn't necessarily bring the same image to mind. Our individual ideas of cowboy are based on where we were raised and how old we are and how much we know about history in the West, among many other factors. Many people in Texas are likely to distinguish between real cowboys and weekend cowboys. People uh, on the East Coast are likely to tell you cowboys don't exist. In popular media, the image of the cowboy has undergone drastic transformations over the years, and what the media feeds to us also influences how we think about this. So, for example, if you're me, uh, I'm in my 40s, I'm from the East Coast, my long-standing image of the cowboy was this. And this. The urban cowboy, right? My idea of the cowboy was a man who drives a pickup truck in the city. On Saturday night, he puts on his dress boots and pressed jeans, and he goes to the bar to show off his two-step moves. Now, after I moved to New York City for college, my image of the cowboy began to include another variation, the gay urban cowboy. The cowboy in New York City was typically a gay man who performed a kind of hyper-masculinity by dressing the part of the Western male. But for others, the cowboy looks more like this. He's a fiercely independent man of the unsettled West who lives by his own rules. A century and a half ago, you would have found him drinking hard liquor in a saloon where decent women were not allowed. He could even be an outlaw with guns hidden beneath his duster. And for some, this kind of cowboy is simply extinct. But for others, he actually has new, more modern incarnations. So for example, this one. Um, another variation on this genre of cowboy is the good version rather than the outlaw. He has very similar characteristics of being a man of few words who is acutely aware of his surroundings. Um, he's highly ethical, so he's the kind of man for whom a, a handshake is just as good or better than a written contract. For people whose mind harkens back to the 1940s and 50s, the cowboy may look like this. He's a man whose dress shirt bears fringe, right? He sits on a stoop, sweetly playing guitar, serenading the girl next door. In his spare time, this cowboy protects innocent children and upholds the law. Or maybe your image of the cowboy has to do with the man's relationship to animals. On the left is the soft-spoken yet rugged man who has a unique ability to communicate with horses. And that's a, a Christian horse whisperer up in Wyoming, there on the left. On the right is the rodeo cowboy who may compete at wrestling steers or who makes his living by riding bulls or otherwise dominating animals. And this is just to name a few of the many cowboy images. This confusing array of ideas about what the cowboy is is the result of a century and a half of changing imagery. And often the newly emergent idea of the cowboy actually gets rolled into the old image rather than just replacing it. So it becomes a new sort of amalgamation. The reality of the cowboy profession has changed dramatically during this period. And the American populace has had ebbs and flows in its fascination with his lifestyle. We've romanticized him as dangerous, just as we've romanticized him as heroic. He's gruff, yet he's sensitive. He's the star of books and television and films. Um, and every one of these images and others has been represented. The newest version of romanticization of the cowboy is the Christian cowboy. And it builds on many of his previous incarnations. 
The Christian cowboy is a rugged family man. He may not have an extensive formal education, but he is sincere. He's learned from his own rough past, and now he's on the straight and narrow. Today, his work may be in agriculture or the cattle industry, but even if it isn't, he spends his downtime in agriculture fooling with horses. He teaches his children to ride and occasionally participates in ranch rodeos. At home, he's the man of the house and the head of his family, such that he has the final say in all things. He believes in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and he humbles himself in prayer each day, setting the example for his wife and children. It is this image, the 21st century Christian cowboy, that's at the heart of this burgeoning religious trend in the United States, found especially but not solely in the West. This image is the inspiration for what is called the Cowboy Church, as well as for numerous publications and organizations that are especially tailored to appeal to him. Now, is this who attends Cowboy Church? Yes, and not only him. Broadly speaking, the attendees are Western culture people, be they ranchers, farmers, rodeoers, or just horse enthusiasts. Some attract a motorcycle crowd. One pastor said he has a number of outlaws among his congregants. But who the crowd is really varies often depending on where the church is located. Ellis County Cowboy Church up in Waxahachie is considered the flagship cowboy church for Texas Baptists. Gary Morgan, the pastor of that church, said to me, if you're defining a cowboy as a person that goes out here and makes his living working cows, there's not six cowboys in all of Ellis County, but there's an awful lot of people that love the rural lifestyle and identify with it. He pointed out that although these people may own some land and a couple of horses, at the end of the day, they're living in a far suburb of a major metropolitan area, and the hat and boots they put on for church may live in a closet the rest of the week. Two other pastors in similarly suburban churches very frankly described their congregations as a horseless cowboy church and a cowboy wannabe church. But in contrast, in places that are further out, for example, Lone Oak, Texas, and Mejia, Texas, whose pastor is gracing us with his presence this evening, a greater portion of the people who attend are much more likely to actually work in ranching broadly defined. If they come into service on Sunday with muddy boots, it's because they've been out working since the wee hours of the morning. Nonetheless, regardless of how rural or urban the church is, it's going to contain people whose identity is rooted in a genuine Western culture the kinds of things they identify with, not just the clothing or the music, but the, the sort of things they read, um, the, the lingo they use, all sorts of things are distinctly Western, and, and the people who identify with that are the ones who are attracted to the cowboy church. So what's it like? What is a cowboy church service like? This is one of the questions I get very frequently, and again, I'm sort of like, Ugh, I don't know. Um, this too really varies from place to place. Um, in some places, nothing feels very different from other Protestant churches except that the physical space is different. Um, here in Stewart, Oklahoma, this is a very typical looking cowboy church. The building is likely to be a simple metal structure with a polished concrete floor, and there may be some understated Western theme decor around. People are wearing jeans, men are wearing boots and hats, and the music has a country twang, but otherwise, in many places, it won't feel especially different from a Baptist service somewhere else. And I've been to many cowboy churches that look different in this way, but don't particularly feel different. But then there are places where it feels very, very different. So, for example, some, some cowboy churches are held in an arena. In Owasso, Oklahoma, they set out folding chairs right in the arena dirt, and the pastor preaches his sermon from atop a horse. In others, you sit in the arena's spectator seats, and the pastor's stage is pulled up on the back of a pickup. In this church, in Grapevine, Texas, the seating is a hodgepodge of kitchen tables. Instead of facing the pastor during the service, you face each other, and people are encouraged to sit with folks they haven't met before, which is tons of fun. <laughs> 
So most cowboy churches have lively performance oriented music, which is to say it's not your standard hymns and you're never expected to sing along. Uh, there's no choir. The best of them have a country western style band made up of members. Others have guest artists who rotate. Um, the type of music is basically anything goes as long as it's arranged in a country western style. As one member of a Texas cowboy church commented, if it's on the radio and it's got the word God in it, it passes. A cowboy church service will include a time for congregational greeting, which is not uncommon in many Christian churches, where people get up and greet each other during a pause in the service. Here it's often called something like the howdy. And um, it's an unusually extensive period in some cowboy churches, and it's very gregarious. Um, I've been to two churches where it actually lasted 15 minutes, which is a really long time if you're there alone and you don't know anyone. Um, but it's always a fascinating part of the service for me to, to watch how members of the congregation interact with each other, and also to see how they interact with a stranger who's in their midst. It's, it's very telling about the congregation on a lot of levels, I find. Uh, in Cowboy Church, they rarely pass an offering plate. Instead, free will offerings are accepted in a nonchalant donation bucket near the back door. Many have cowboy-friendly Bibles. Sermons are both humorous and practical, simple but not simplistic, as one pastor described it to me. And finally, the lingo is different. Western cowboy-oriented language is employed, from the names they give to aspects of church life to the stories they tell in sermons. With some cowboy churches, this is very deliberate and heavy-handed, and pastors have admitted as much in interviews. But in lots of places, it's quite subtle and, I think, more natural. Either way, it's certainly characteristic of all of them. You'll hear Jesus being likened to a cowboy because of his ethics. You'll hear morality stories that involve cowboys, farms, and ranches. Lessons about learning to grow in your Christian faith will involve horse analogies or rodeo examples. Church leadership positions may be named things like point riders and segundos. There's even the occasional use of Western props, such as when Randy Reasoner of New Hope Cowboy Ministry brought in a horse to help illustrate his sermon titled, oh, you can't even see it, darn, it's titled Get Off the Milk. So his horse is right there with him. So disappointing, you can't see that. Um, <clears throat> to me, though, the man who put it best was Pastor Jake Shuey in Avondale, Colorado, who said, you know you're in a cowboy church when you hear rectal palpation used as a sermon example. Outside the services, an important aspect of many cowboy churches is an arena ministry. The basic idea is to have an arena as part of your church and to use it to attract cowboy culture people. In turn, you introduce cowboys to Jesus, and if possible, you get them to participate in church. And the process begins the moment you start building the arena, when local people are likely to stop by, check out what's going on, see if they can lend a hand. Um, those with arenas tend to have events a couple nights a week to get people just coming through on a regular basis. And then they work religion into the arena ministry. Um, so for example, a couple of months ago, I went to this um, open team roping in Tyler, Texas. Um, it began with a five minute talk from a preacher who blended commentary on the activity they were about to engage in with some talk about Jesus. And then he ended with a prayer for everyone's safety. Others I've heard may include a discussion of God's commands about humans and animals, or maybe a biblical story. But in any case, whenever it's done really well, it's a completely unintrusive form of evangelism by just naturally tying the arena event to a little bit of ministry. To some pastors, the arena ministry is the crux of what distinguishes Cowboy Church. And without it, they believe the heart of the entire mission is lost. As Pastor Mike Morrow puts it, you're not keeping it culturally relevant if you don't have an arena or if you have an arena that doesn't have hoof prints in it. Similarly, Mike Meeks of the Nazarene Church asserts that the success of a cowboy church is the arena. But not every cowboy church has an active arena ministry. Many cannot afford to build one. Others simply don't want one. For example, cowboy churches who recognize that their urban proximity makes an arena ministry an unrealistic goal. 
One church in Oklahoma specifically moved out of an arena because the pastor felt there was too much emphasis on it, and as he said, it was becoming a rope and horse show. So why cowboys? Why are the churches seeking out cowboys and other people who identify with Western culture and, and Western heritage? Uh, in looking at the answers to this question, I find the churches to be largely unified regardless of where they're located, regardless of how old they are, and even regardless of denomination. The pastors phrase it differently from each other, but essentially they're saying that they feel the real cowboy culture people is an audience that has been left out of other churches, or as some put it, left behind by Christianity. The cowboy culture people have either never been involved in church or they dropped out of the church they were raised in a very long time ago and no one ever sought to bring them back in. So the cowboy churches are seeking to spread the Christian gospel to a group they see as ripe for evangelism because they're otherwise not being reached by Christianity. And I'll say that by and large they do seem to be correct on this. Um, cowboy churches do not seem to be taking members from other churches. They're actually creating new churchgoers, which I find very interesting. Um, I, I can't say that based on a hard statistical study. I haven't done one and I won't be doing one, but it is supported by what the ministers are telling me about their congregations and it's supported by my casual chit chats with members that they really are creating new churchgoers instead of just being this new sexy thing that you know seeker types kind of pass in and out of. Um, and I find that just very, very interesting. Uh, it's certainly a point I'm going to be pursuing more as I continue with this research. Um, now, as an aside, I can say that some preachers talk about what a challenge this is for them. Even though creating new Christians is the goal, it comes with problems. So Shane Winters, for example, who's a cowboy pastor in Mejia, said his greatest ministry challenge is that his church is pre predominantly populated by new Christians. They don't have much knowledge of the Bible. They don't have much understanding of what it takes to keep a church going as a full member. Um, they haven't been surrounded by examples of people who have a maturity of Christian faith, who've kept that faith through good times and bad over the long term, and on and on. And he pointed out how unusual that is. A Christian congregation is usually made up of people in all different stages of a faith journey. And he's by no means the only pastor who's said this to me. So um, this is definitely something that sets the cowboy church apart uh, from a sociological development perspective, is how many new churchgoers they have as, as their membership. For me, the question that follows why is the question of how. <laughs> how are they doing it? How are they not only attracting cowboys but also keeping them in the church? And there are several different things operative in this process. One is the arena ministry, which I've already spoken about. Um, this attracts lots of people to church events and of course some small portion is going to become more involved in the church. Um, and also arena ministry may have a host of sub-ministries for particular rodeo sports or particular demographics within the church. And so that also functions to bring people in in different ways. A second approach that addresses the how question is what the Baptist cowboy churches call the low barrier method. As Gary Morgan of Ellis County explains it, many rural people who work in manual labor find the average church to be uncomfortable. It's too fancy, it's too nice, it's too stiff. The formality of regular church becomes a barrier to those people. Hence, Cowboy Church attempts to lower the barrier. This includes many of the service features I've already referred to, such as no offering, no expectation to sing along, casual attire, no public altar call. Um, it also includes making the Bible an accessible text and not making assumptions about what people may, may or may not know about its content. The cowboy churches that are not Baptist are essentially taking the same approach, though they don't all use this specific lingo. And then the third major way that churches are working to attract and keep the cowboy has to do with gender, more specifically making church a masculine space. 
The impetus for this is various studies from the 1980s and 1990s, which found that in the past century, the mainstream Protestant church has been, become an uncomfortable environment for men, visually, structurally, and in ethos. And that's why women are typically the, the dominant members of Protestant churches today. So in contrast, the cowboy church puts men front and center. The physical space is intentionally rough without frills. Men and men alone are eligible to hold the top leadership positions, pastors, elders, lay pastors. Now the studies I referred to actually don't indicate clear solutions to men's lack of church involvement. They really just identify the problem so the idea that these attributes will keep men in the church long term are relatively experimental, and we don't yet know how it's going to play out. Also relevant to the gender issue is that generally speaking for Western culture heritage people, there's an emphasis on men as leaders of the family. So the churches believe that if you can keep the father in the church, then you've also got the women coming and then the children coming. And so that's another reason that they focus on men. Now, a great number of cowboy churches are completely unaffiliated, they're independent, not attached to a denomination, and their approach may involve any number of different things. Um, and even, even these things I've listed, certainly there are exceptions within the general scope of cowboy churches. But these three things, the arena ministry, the low barrier method, and the masculine focus is where I find the most commonality among all of the cowboy churches, as well as the fact that they're trying to reach those who are not attending church, who they often refer to as unchurched unbelievers. Another question I've been pursuing as part of the larger project is where it all comes from. So, in other words, what's the history of the cowboy church? Tracing the history of the cowboy church is this really imprecise art, if I can call it that. It's kind of a puzzle because I found that cowboys are really not good at keeping track of their own history. <laughs> They're much more concerned with the day-to-day -day and with tomorrow than with yesterday and records and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's a bit of a, a job for me. Um, I've come to think of three periods of cowboy history, as I've outlined here, the short history that goes back about 30 years, uh, then there's a century of medium history, and then the post-Civil War era to a, around 1900 is the long history. Um, but I, I'm still thinking on this, so this may change a little bit. But the golden era of the American cowboy lasted from approximately 1865 to 1895, which is why I've teased that out as the, the first period. At the end of the Civil War, there was an increase in beef consumption in the United States and correspondingly an expansion of the ranching industry. Cowboys at that time were tough working guys. They worked in very rough conditions during long days that turned into months for very little pay. They drove the cattle across the land for grazing. They rounded them up again. They dealt with them during birthing and branding. Um, and when the cattle were ready for sale, they drove them east to the ends of the rail lines. In the off season, they typically found work on farms and ranches doing odd jobs. So it was not by any means a glamorous life. And yet this is the exact era when the American populace at large began its love affair with the cowboy and painted him as this brave figure, this heroic figure, this you know, romanticized image of him. So during this era, what we have in terms of religion among cowboys is three things. The first is circuit preachers. Typically, circuit preachers were trained, ordained pastors within a recognized denomination who rode horseback all over the West to preach the gospel. And so most of these had a very specific circuit that they preached. Town A, the first Sunday of the month, Town B, the second Sunday, and so on. And pretty much every major Protestant denomination had a circuit preacher or five or 10 riding around the West. Um, but there's a subset of these circuit preachers who were targeting the moving populations. Uh, the cowboy's work meant he was constantly moving from place to place, so he is one of the targets of that subset of circuit preachers. Now, there's very little evidence to go on about their success. They're basically chasing the cowboy, trying to meet up with him in the evenings when he's got a little downtime around the campfire. Uh, but their success doesn't seem to have been that great. 
it's just one notable aspect of religious life among cowboys during that period that someone was trying to deliberately create a sense of religiosity among them. The second thing you have, um, and the thing I find more interesting, is the homegrown cowboy preachers. These were men who were cowboys first, who got religion, and after a period of preaching to their fellow cowboys, often sought ministerial credentials and became pastors in a more formalized way. The way it is expressed in today's cadence is uh, the path from pastor to pastorate. So there are many, many examples of these men. Um, we have one here, John Anderson. Uh, this is his memoir on the left. He grew up in Texas and he rode the range starting at age 10. And even as a child, he was nicknamed the Little Preacher. After a cowboy career in which he moved up to being boss of the roundup, Anderson was ordained as a Baptist pastor at Baylor. Another example here is Will James, also of Texas, who worked as a cowboy, and after converting, considered himself a missionary among them. James was very critical of the intrusive circuit preachers who came through. In his 1893 memoir, he wrote, it's certainly quite amusing to see little six, a little six-bit fellow start out to slinging slang from the pulpit, posing as a cowboy preacher. He usually procures a 10-ounce hat with a leather band, a pair of high-heeled boots, and then he's sailing. I met one such, and in conversation with him, found to my astonishment and disgust that he had never been on a regular cow ranch in his life. He didn't know the first letter in the cowman's alphabet. So again, although we can't measure success even among these homegrown cowboy preachers, there is some evidence to indicate they were a little bit more welcomed in the cowboy community than the outsider circuit preachers were. And I, I think that's a situation that relates a lot to, to what we see today happening in the cowboy ch churches. The third aspect of cowboy religion during this period was the cowboy camp meeting. These were religious revivals set up on the frontier. People would camp at the meeting for a week or two and participate in social activities which centered around religion. There were a number of these around, but the biggest and most well-known was Bloy's Cowboy Camp Meeting near Fort Davis, Texas. William Bloy's, a Presbyterian minister, moved to Texas in 1880 and preached on ranches, in saloons, and in gambling dens. He started the multi-denominational camp meeting in 1890 so that, quote, there could be a place for the cowboys and the ranch people to meet together and worship the Lord. It, <clears throat> it was a deliberate effort to create a sense of Christian religion among frontier people, especially those who lived in very rural areas who would be unlikely to hitch up a wagon and go to a Sunday service, even if there was one in close range. So the event was called a cowboy camp meeting, even though its population always included much more than that. Centrally located at Blois was the prayer tree, where men would meet for daily prayer. Historian Joe Evans wrote that the prayer tree is the spiritual powerhouse for the camp meetings. Scores of old, hard, sinful cowboys have found the Lord under the prayer tree. The cowboys have named this tree their spiritual hitching post. Blois became such a popular meeting that eventually they began satellite meetings in other states. And most of those eventually fizzled out, but the original Blois continues on to this day with an annual cowboy camp meeting in the Davis Mountains. So that's act one of cowboy church history. Um, these are clear examples of religion targeting cowboys, um, even though in many cases it probably reached a wider audience, especially with the camp meetings. Uh, the middle period of cowboy church history begins, begins on the tail end of this, so 1895, 1900, give or take. And one aspect of cowboy Christianity during this period was the continuation of the itinerant cowboy pastor. This included many men who had genuine roots in Western culture and who had some theological training and who found work traveling from place to place as cowboy preachers. But the difference was that by the 1900s, there's no longer a migrating population for them to seek out or to travel with. So the new incarnation of the cowboy preacher at this point becomes the guest speaker. Uh, there are many examples of these men. Um, so for example, we see here Leonard Eilers. He attracted crowds with his sermons titled God and the Rancher and Christ and the Cowboy. 
Others included Bill Durbin, a cowboy preacher whose wife and son took part in his traveling music-oriented service, and Jay Kellogg, a cowboy evangelist who guest preached at Angelus Temple in Los Angeles in the 1930s. We can't know who these cowboy preachers were really reaching with their message, but it seems likely they would most often have been an entertaining religious distraction for people who had a, an affinity for Western culture, but who were otherwise involved in mainstream, mainstream Protestant churches. It doesn't appear they were really reaching a genuine cowboy audience, nor were they necessarily trying to. Their existence corresponds with the pop culture fascination with the pure-hearted singing cowboy, and I don't think that's a coincidence. As an extension of this, also during this period was a radio show hosted by songwriter Stuart Hamblin called The Cowboy Church of the Air. It began in 1940 and went on and off the air a couple of times during the ensuing decades, and it was nationally syndicated. The content of the show was music and Western themed stories that were religiously oriented. And so just as with the cowboy preachers moving to the urban settings and playing up cowboy values, this show popularized an ideal version of Western culture for the masses and added a religious element. At the tail end of this period and perhaps acting as a catalyst for the third phase of cowboy church history was the emergence of the rodeo church. Two organizations that began in the early 1970s were important for this. One that we see here, Cowboys for Christ, founded by Ted Presley in 1970. The other was Fellowship of Christian Cowboys, a 1973 offshoot of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Both groups sponsored church services at rodeo events and also published newspapers, and both are still very active today. Neither group invented rodeo church, but they regularized it from being a random and occasional event. By creating a constancy of religious culture tied in with rodeo events, I believe it set the stage for the modern era when people began to establish more permanent cowboy churches, some of which even grew directly out of rodeo ministries. Now the exact moment that the modern cowboy church movement began is surprisingly hard to pinpoint considering it wasn't that long ago, but it continues to vex me. Um, what is clear is that there was a bubble of churches that began in Texas in the 1990s, all independent of each other, each calling itself a cowboy church. It's also clear that in the early 2000s, the idea caught on like wildfire. And since that time, there's been explosive growth Today, there are hundreds of cowboy churches in Texas alone. Baptists have at least two organizations entirely committed to fostering them. The Nazarenes have an active cowboy church planting network. The Assemblies of God have a number of cowboy churches and have expressed interest in pursuing it with greater vigor. And there are even a handful of Seventh-day Adventist ones. And this isn't just Texas, Oklahoma, the Plains states. This is all across the United States. There are cowboy churches in at least 20 states, um, and there are Christian cowboy organizations in every state and in Canada and in several European countries as well. Many different cowboy churches claim to be the first one. And while there is probably a real answer to that question, it also probably doesn't make much difference. Um, but I like to acknowledge a few moments on the historic timeline that are early notables. So for example, here we see Billy Bob's Bar in Texas, if anyone's been there. No? Yes. Okay, all right, we've all been there, I've been there. Um, in January 1986, a cowboy church was started in Billy Bob's Bar uh, with rodeoer uh, Jeff Copenhaver as the pastor. Copenhaver did not consider himself a preacher, and what began as a temporary stint in their bull riding arena as part of a rodeo turned into a regular weekly service that lasted there for two years and spurred several friendly copycat churches in other places. Another moment, the Cowboy Church of Henrietta, Texas first began meeting in a sale barn in 1993. A core group met twice a month with several men rotating duties as preacher. By 1997, they had their own building, a settled pastor, and a congregation that was quickly outgrowing the new space. They celebrated their 20th anniversary earlier this year, and they're also noteworthy for being the designers of the kneeling cowboy image. This is the original kneeling cowboy image that you see here. 
And if you go to Henrietta, it's actually way up on a hill so that you can see it as you're driving. At, at night, there's lights shining on it. It's, it's quite lovely. Um, Shepherd's Valley, an Assemblies of God cowboy church, began in 1997 in a Benbrook, Texas arena. Today, you can find about 700 people attending their two Sunday morning services, and tens of thousands more watch their weekly cowboy church television show broadcast on RFD TV. And many give most of the credit for the modern movement to Ron Nolan, a former church planter for the Texas Baptists, who got the idea to create a worship space for local cowboy types in the Expo Center in Waxahachie in 2000. 64 people attended his first service. 311 attended the second one. Can't even imagine. This church grew so quickly that Nolan realized there was an exciting mission opportunity among this group of relatively unchurched people. Nolan moved on to plant other cowboy churches in Texas, facilitating their start and always handing off leadership as soon as a permanent pastor could be found. Nolan is usually credited with creating the low barrier method, which was influenced by Lee Strobel's book about bringing religion to unchurched Mary and Harry. He is also among the initial designers of the Baptist training seminar offered to anyone interested in starting a new cowboy church, which is now offered several times a year. Um, and I attended one of these this past summer, and there were nearly a thousand people attending it with me. To give you some idea of the interest. And uh, while all of these are notable moments, there are many other cowboy churches that begin anywhere from the mid to late 1980s to the late 1990s and who don't really care whether anyone notices them or not or, or says they were the first or one of the first. They, they're not concerned with their place in the cowboy church history. Um, I can tell you actually I've found several other cowboy churches going back as early as the 1970s um, in Florida, in California, and in Colorado. And none of those appear to be genealogically linked with the modern cowboy church movement, but it sort of emphasizes to me the point that it, it really doesn't matter who was first. There's probably always someone who was before you. <laughs> um, and that brings us to today. So last year I mapped and color coded all the cowboy churches I could locate in Texas and Oklahoma. I'm not a high tech girl, I'm kind of a pen and paper girl, so I'm also like a a paper maps with push pins girl. I wish this image were better. Um, well, anyway, the, the red, uh, red push pins are Baptist churches, yellow or Nazarene, blue or Adventist, green or independent, black or assemblies of God, and white are unknown or unconfirmed, though I suspect the majority of the white dots are actually independent, so not affiliated with the denomination. Um, I'm positive this map is incomplete. Many churches are really difficult to locate. Some open and close their doors before I even know they exist. Um, but really, if they don't have an affiliation with a denomination or a web presence, they're pretty difficult to find unless you happen to drive by. Um, and gosh, there are so many red dots on that map, but they're not really jumping out. Uh, the Baptists really are, are more than the white dots, but what I'm seeing are the white ones. Anyway. Um, so, to wrap up, I'd like to offer four thoughts about challenges I anticipate the cowboy church will have to grapple with if they want to continue forward as a thriving religious movement. And I list these four points in no particular order. One challenge is the possibility of becoming so popular that their target audience is marginalized within the church. That is, if more non-cowboy culture people start attending than genuine cowboy culture people, it's really going to change the feel of it. This is more likely to happen in certain geographic areas, and some pastors are already talking about it. Pastor Mike Morrow in Tyler, for example, says this dynamic has been a real challenge for him for about five years, as seeker types increasingly find his church appealing. The only way he actively combats it is to make sure those members are not allowed to change the structure or the mission. Keeping it cowboy, he says, is one of his greatest challenges these days. I suspect that many cowboy churches will have to confront this issue, and so it's something they may need to consider with greater depth or maybe an action plan. 
Second is tension over denominational affiliation, which I found brewing in different ways among Baptist affiliates, Nazarene affiliates, and unaffiliated cowboy churches. Many pastors of denominational cowboy churches have said to me they're really not interested in denominationalism. Some have said their only reason for formal affiliation is to gain tax-exempt status. One said he affiliated with Baptists technically, quote, but I told them I don't agree with a lot of what they represent. By my estimate, about 30% of cowboy churches are totally independent, which means they operate without a system of external checks and balances. This could lead to creative theology, improprieties with money, and many other dangers. Though I don't really mean to suggest that just because you're in a denomination, you're immune to such problems. Related to this is what Pastor Gary Morgan described as the issue of the shallow pulpit, which is to say his concern about pastors who have no formal theological training and thus may have limited ministerial skills. Morgan commented that some cowboy pastors quote, are not good communicators and their messages lack depth. They have wrongly gotten the impression that simple means shallow and there's a difference. So going forward, I think it would behoove cowboy churches to think about some kind of affiliation that would help them maintain organizational integrity, even if it means breaking away from denominations to start something entirely separate. And I will add that some cowboy pastors themselves are talking about this, so it's not just my crazy idea as an outsider looking in. A third challenge for the future is the potential for hypocrisy, especially in the area of morality. Most cowboy churches operate on the premise that all humans are sinful and that we need to focus on form what we need to focus on foremost is getting right with God, and then God will nurture us on the path to becoming less sinful people. So for those who prefer the technical terms, that means they emphasize justification first and sanctification as a secondary ongoing process. And so ideally, that means cowboy church is going to contain many people who might be considered sinful in some way. Um, and the goal, of course, is to accept people at whatever stage they're in. Um, but of course, this isn't actually easy. Cowboy churches open themselves up to contradiction when they determine that certain types of sinful behavior are okay for members to have, while other types of sinful behavior are less acceptable. So as an example, I've heard two different cowboy pastors speak about what happens when a woman attends church wearing some sort of clothing that's quite revealing. One pastor said, if you come around here on a Thursday night, it'll burn your eyeballs out what some of these girls come up here wearing. But his perspective is, you welcome that woman just like everyone else. You encourage her to keep attending, and you trust that as she grows in her faith, God will help her begin to change how she presents herself. And that is cowboy church. But the second pastor said something different. He said, what you do is you keep a few sweaters and jackets around, and when she comes in for service, you have someone offer her one. I consider that second pastor's approach a little bit theologically problematic based on the ideal of the cowboy church. And based on what I've seen and heard in my visits and interviews, hypocritical stances about certain types of sin are not uncommon. And fourth, there are going to be challenges related to gender. Clearly, these churches are on to something about how to attract men to church. They definitely have a higher proportion of men actively engaged in church. And they are correct that some research shows children are more likely to become involved in church when their father is actively engaged. But there are other studies that indicate women will leave a church when they don't perceive it as a place that offers them opportunities for leadership and a voice. The fact that their husband wants them to attend is not necessarily going to be enough for them to stay for the long term. Thus far, the cowboy churches seem so proud of themselves for solving the male problem that they don't seem to be anticipating a future female problem, and I suspect they need to be. As distinct as Western heritage people imagine themselves to be, they're really not that far removed from mainstream American social, cultural, and educational influences that emphasize gender equality. So I anticipate that if the church wants to remain relevant for the long term, it will need a plan to deal with these issues and not just a Bible passage. 
And that leads me to my final thought, perhaps most telling, is that many cowboy pastors do not actually believe there's a biblical basis for denying women positions of religious leadership. In private and off the record, more than half the pastors I've spoken with have said outright they don't think it's biblical. They're merely touting strict gender roles because it helps them attract their target audience, but they don't believe in it as a biblical mandate or theological truth. So in closing, I do have great respect for cowboy churches and the people. They are straightforward, and I love that. Um, and my goal with this work, as it continues, is to be equally straightforward in um, showing what it's about, both the, the pretty and the not so pretty. So thank you. done that actually why do you suspect that that they actually are taking members from other churches no that's not what I meant um, I meant more of traditional churches are shrinking oh just in general, in general. ah no I haven't actually yeah, that's a good thing I might want to look at that that might show us something yes I, this is fascinating to me I hadn't been aware of the denominational linkages of so many of these churches have you found that uh, within particular communions, among the Baptist churches, among Nazarene, among the Pentecostal churches, if there's anything in the way of commonalities of uh, liturgy or of service or even theology or uh, Calvinist theology or Arminian or evangelical or whatever, or is it just kind of... It's really all across form? the board. I wouldn't yeah. say it's free form necessarily. I mean, some places it's a little free form. things prevail over these largely evangelical churches? They are largely evangelical. I think what unites them is more like sociological approaches. So it's it's more in the doing and the how-to than in the theology that they're united. Yeah. Do, do the denominations provide, the, the ones that are affiliated, like with the, the Nazarene Church or, or, or assemblies, do the denominations provide anything? Oh, sure. Or, or Oh, well, it varies from, from denomination to denomination. But, I mean, certainly they are supposed to be adhering to the basic doctrine of that denomination. But I think it's less emphasized in Cowboy Church. It's more about, like, let's get these people in. Let's create a new religious community. And then slowly you introduce the doctrine. But, as I found, some of the pastors are resistant to that. They're really not into the doctrine to begin with. So uh, that seems a little bit awkward. I'm not sure how that's going to play out, you know. Um, I met one guy um, about six weeks ago. He started a new cowboy church in the past six months or so. And he said he's currently independent, but he's thinking about affiliating with the Baptist. But there are some points of Baptist theology he's uncomfortable with. And the Baptists want him to affiliate, but he's uncomfortable, so he doesn't know what to do. And I, I thought that was interesting that he's sort of trying to think it through in this way. Yeah. About race, are these mm. exclusively white churches for the most part, or um, do you have examples of African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans um, participating? It's mostly a white phenomenon. I mean, you get your smattering of Latino, Native American, occasionally African American people in these churches, but it's mostly a white phenomenon. Um, there is one Spanish speaking cowboy church I know of, it's in South Texas somewhere, I can't remember what town exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, race doesn't seem to come into play here a whole lot. Yeah. So in an independent church, how would one become a member? It's going to vary from church to church because right. they're independent. So they've all got their own rules. Right. <laughs> right? Do you find commonalities? I mean, if you know, you're trying to attract a target audience and want to embrace um, anyone, you know, sinful or it wouldn't matter the degree of sin, let's say. Mm -hmm. But then how does one you know, kind of formally affiliate as far as membership? And any commonalities? Well, no, I don't think there are commonalities, but for some of them it really doesn't matter. It's not about membership. It's about bringing Jesus to this group of people. If you get them to come once a month, that's good enough. Like, you're, you're maybe not good enough, but it's like, it's a start. Right. So membership is a long-range goal. 
Um, it's more about confession of sins, starting a new relationship with God. Um, it, it's about the relationship, not so much the, like, we want you to be a tithe-paying member. Right. And what about in Baptist or some of the denominationally affiliated ones? Because it does seem like such a hard thing to gauge. You know, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you track this over time? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that there's really some commonality that you could say about that, actually. Yeah, it really varies. And I've even talked to some pastors where, uh, like, a, you know, most of these churches are so new that they've had one pastor. But there are some where you, they've had a couple of pastors or three pastors or something. Um, but I've talked to a couple people where they say, well, the old pastor used to let people become members in this way or at this point, and I've changed it a little bit. So there's that also going on. So it makes it harder to generalize. Yeah, it's fascinating, the yeah. fluidity. Uh huh. Thanks for coming. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> this is fascinating. Uh, I, I was the um, ad from the newspaper mm -hmm. from Los Angeles. Yep. I know that church. Oh, you do? I've, I've been by it. It's, it, it's the, the University Bible Church right on Wilshire. Uh -huh. and, and the university that it's by is UCLA. That's oh. just a couple of, a couple of blocks from UCLA. That is one of the wealthiest areas. Mm. That's Westwood. That's that's one of the wealthiest areas in all of, of uh, Los Angeles. Huh. And was yeah. it at, like in the 30s or 20s? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, it's, uh, right across the street is a huge Jewish synagogue mm -hmm. uh, it, it would hold a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a fairly large church, but... Uh, or the other gentleman I mentioned who preached at Angelus Temple. I mean, that's a major temple that's had books oh, yeah, written about it. That's so, one of the first mega church. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, that's, that's over in, in Hollywood, uh, some distance away. But uh, the, this cowboy theme, uh, the, the preaching cowboy kind of thing, was, was very popular back in the 50s. There were a number of, and mostly entertainers who mm -hmm. had turned preacher. Uh, but who could sing? Uh, there was a guy named Nevada Slim, was it? That, that was very popular. I remember seeing advertisements for him uh, with the big white hat and mm -hmm. the kerchief at the side of his neck and the lock. It's, uh, it, it's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it, it, it is also in, within the Evangelical movement, very much like mm -hmm. the uh, the movements to build goth churches and mm -hmm. uh, like and, and deal with other uh, subcultures that are getting neglected by them. Right, the and I really see it as a movement. I think it's a a movement. People question me for using that term, but I, I do. I think it's organized and widespread and moving forward. <laughs> well, it, fit, it certainly fits classic definitions of social movement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that real sense, and given the population explosion, it's it's still got a growing edge to it. Uh, 